Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for hopping in this morning to learn about recruiting diverse students at the Cockrell School of Engineering at UT Austin. We are excited to welcome you this morning. This is normally a presentation that we do in person, so we miss seeing all of your faces. We miss breakfast at Expo. We typically do this during the breakfast time before you all get started at your booths. At this time, we decided to do it a week ahead, record it, share it out, and give you a little bit more time because we know that being on Zoom and on Career Echo next week for our career fair will be a long day already, and we did not want to throw a breakfast in there for you. So my name is Trisha Berry. I am director of the Women in Engineering program. I'll let each of our other fabulous panelists introduce themselves as well before we get started, and you'll hear from all of them as we go along. Enrique? Yeah. Thanks, Trisha. Uh, good morning. My name is Enrique Dominguez. Uh, pronouns are he, him, and I am the director of the EOE program. Allison? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Bonner, director of Engineering Student Life, and pronouns are she, her. And then Michael. Perfect. Michael Powell, uh, director of the Engineering Career Center. Am I throwing this over to anybody else? I think Michelle Mansolo just joined in. We Michelle. will connect with her if she's on. Or we'll come back to her in a little bit. She just popped in. So we'll come back to her. You'll hear from her as well. All right. Well, let's get started. Let me tell you just a little bit about the Women in Engineering program. So we are a staff program within the Engineering Student Services in the Cockrell School here to recruit, retain, and graduate women to advance gender equity in engineering. And we do that in a number of ways. One of those is really to create this network of our engineering students, their peers, professionals, role models that come from companies like yours, and provide them that academic and career and leadership opportunities so they can gain skills and, and continue in their own learning and growth. We also have what we call our Women in Engineering Program Leadership Collaborative, which is made up of over 15 student organizations that serve women across the Cockrell School and even beyond into other STEM majors. And we sort of support them with leadership development. Many of you participate in their general meetings and different events that our student organizations host. And we provide a structure to help connect them and support them as they continue in their efforts in their student organizations. Good morning again. Um, and I'll tell you about the EOE program or the Equal Opportunity and Engineering program. So our mission is in short to recruit, retain, and graduate um, underrepresented ethnic minorities and other marginalized uh, other students who have marginalized identities in the Carco School. So that is a plethora of identities, not only including um, low socioeconomic, first generation, but also veterans, uh, students who identify with the LGBTQIA community, students who may be part of rural or uh, rural parts of Texas or even out of state. Um, but we definitely want to create a community that is inclusive and provides opportunities for students to make their pathways through uh, their college career, um, but also maybe even into their professional career or maybe even academia if they choose to. Uh, we work hand in hand with Pi Sigma Pi, um, which is a minority academic engineering organization founded locally at UT Austin um, and the National Society of Black Engineers or NSBE. With We also work with SHIP, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. And this year we have a new graduate organization called GUM, Graduates for Underrepresented Minorities. Um, and we help them build their peer network and their support network, uh, along with, again, like Trisha said, uh, the support of you, uh, company reps, as well as alumni and other mentors in, in the community. So thank you all for being here. So for today, we have lots of things going on. Uh, we'll give you some updates from the Cockrell School. Uh, we'll, we'll give some time to Allison and Michelle to talk about some things going on in their spaces. Um, we will give you the numbers, the diversity numbers, as to what it looks like as of the first class day. Uh, we'll get into some discussion and some topics uh, about recruiting diverse uh, engineering students. Uh, Michael is here to give you some updates and to talk a little bit about Career Eco and if you have any questions, uh, the floor will be there. Um, and then we'll be able all to answer some questions at the end. 
So Michelle Meyer sends her regrets. She was not able to join us this morning, but wanted to send a hello and a welcome to all of you and a thank you for supporting all of our students. Michelle is the Assistant Dean for Engineering Student Services. So we're sorry to miss her this morning, but wanted to make sure that we got her hello in to you all. So with that, we are gonna turn it over to Michelle Mansolo. Michelle, we'll let you tell them all about engineering scholarships. Good morning, sorry, I had to find the mute button again. <laughs> um, good morning and uh, we're happy to be able to visit with you, even if it's virtually. Uh, we wanted to share some information with you about the opportunities in the Cockrell School related to our scholarship program. Um, this is one of the things that we offer that really provides a one-on-one, -on -one, if you want it to be a relationship building tool because you have access to meet and visit with the students who are selected for any scholarships that are supported by a company and to really cultivate that relationship as the students go on through their career within the Cockrell School. And uh, one of the things that we like to promote is the fact that we can target these scholarships to different groups, whether that be a student who's focused on a particular area in their major, or if the students are active participants in the Women in Engineering program, the AOE program, or any of the student organization programs that are connected to them. And we really do appreciate that support that we've had from many of the companies who may be viewing this. And we look forward to any new companies that might be interested in that. And uh, I'm sure that the contact information will be shared and I uh, would be happy to visit one-on-one -on -one to answer any questions about how the process works and to get started if any companies would like to do that. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And don't forget, you can throw questions in the Q&A pod if you have questions for Michelle. And in the meantime, we'll move it over to Allison. Hey everyone, my name is Allison, uh, Director of Engineering Student Life. So the Engineering Student Life Office provides opportunities for students to participate in leadership, team building, cultural and community building activities across Texas engineering. We do this through events such as Gone to Engineering, which is our biggest welcome event for all new students. We had that last Tuesday. We also have Leadership, which is a week-long leadership camp open to all undergraduate students, and many more activities throughout the year. Our office also provides support for over 80 student organizations, which is really fun to get to see them be leaders in their field. So we work really closely with our colleagues um, who are on this call and others. Um, we also love working with you all, our corporate partners, to help students learn and grow and become strong leaders. So we hope you continue to stay involved or like Michelle said, if you aren't involved yet, we'd love for you to get involved and just wanted to say a thank you for the all the support that you do for our students. I know they really appreciate it and we really appreciate it. Thanks Allison. Thanks Michelle. So thank you again, Michelle and Allison, for the updates in your areas and feel free to ask them again some questions that, um, within the question, the Q&A uh, pod that you see down there. Uh, but now we'll get into the numbers. And uh, if y'all are like me, then we love the numbers. So today we'll talk about our fall uh, 2020 enrollment. Uh, we got some good news uh, to, sh to share with everybody. Uh, we'll historically talk about what's been going on in the departments as well as in the college and uh, graduation rates and national comparison rates are still those rates of last year. However, we, we wanted to share them with you again this year, but as the semester progresses and as we get more updated information, we will update that data uh, when we send out the presentation to everybody. So uh, to discuss the enrollment and graduation data for the URN groups, um, here is our stats. Uh, we are up uh, 2.7% and 2 when it comes to our graduate student group. 
Uh, for as long as I've been here, which is now more than eight years, uh, we had not made it over five or six percent. And to see us at 9.1 percent is awesome. Um, and so uh, not only in the graduate space are we making improvements, but we're also making improvements in our first year undergraduate students. We are up 20 uh, we are up 5.1% um, to 28.6%, which is over 330 students. So I am super excited to have this incoming class uh, be the largest it's ever been. Because they are our largest incoming class, we are now at the maximum number of underrepresented students that we've ever had in the Cockrell School. Um, so we are at 22.9%. Um, and that's up 2.2% from last year. So for us to make these strong uh, strides in a positive direction is great news. And you can see there that for our undergraduate populations who were awarded degrees, we were, we were at 14.5% last year. We hope to have that information updated and ready to go once we send this out to everybody in the future. And uh, just so that you know, EOE is celebrating our 50th anniversary. We were planning to have lots of events and ways to engage this year, but because of COVID-19, we have delayed it another year. So you'll be receiving a lot of information from me uh, about how we can engage and how we can get involved next year, um, as this year we use as a, a year to collect information and to collect support um, so we can have this celebration next year. All right, well, let's talk about the enrollment and graduation data for the, our students who identify as women. So also good news here, we are up in our percentage of graduate students. That percentage has been pretty stagnant for the last several years. So it's exciting to see that some of our efforts to really improve the graduate recruiting process and bring more graduate women into our graduate school has, has paid off. So we're up uh, at almost 2% there. As far as our first year undergraduate engineering students, we're right at 30%. That's down a percent from last year, but we're still quite thrilled with that number, um, especially given COVID-19 and that so many of our first year students are 100% online and maybe some didn't even come to campus or chose to go elsewhere. So we're still quite happy with that uh, and that it didn't drop more. Uh, what we're really excited about though is that our overall undergraduate student population has increased just slightly and um, we're happy that that percentage is continuing to slowly rise. That means that our retention of our, our women is staying high and that we're continuing to bring in uh, large cohorts of undergraduate women. So we're, we can round the 30% for overall undergraduate students as well this year. We were not able to do that and make that rounding last year. As far as our graduate, uh, as far as our, our degrees awarded, our graduate graduation numbers. As Enrique said, these are last year's numbers, so we don't have that data just yet to share with you, but we'll be updating those um, as soon as we can later this month. All right, we're not going to spend a lot of time on these slides. Um, we just want to show you what's going to be included in what we send out so you have an idea of, of what to expect and how you can dive into the data and the numbers. And this is showing our enrollment for underrepresented ethnic minorities and our females in the graduate student space. And it's broken down by discipline as well as their different demographics. So you can really dive into the data and see the actual numbers of students that you may be looking to recruit. Um, and then on the next slide, we have percentages. So you can see it in both ways, whichever makes the most sense to you. And then continuing on, um, we have similar data to share for undergraduate students. Enrique, you wanna talk about this one? For sure. So this is a, our enrollment trend uh, for the past five years and how it compares to the data that we have for the state of Texas. And so you can see there that we are from 2016 uh, to, to now 2020, that we have increased our underrepresented minority population and not only by number, but also by percentage. And you can also see there for the women, as well as underrepresented women who, who share that intersectionality of both being underrepresented and being or identifying as female, 
uh, that they are on the rise and they are increasing in number and percentage as well. So we are happy that this year we are seeing the numbers go up um, and that all the efforts that the university has put through in order to focus on recruiting diverse students is, is helping. So this is our historical uh, enrollment as early as the early 70s when it comes to underrepresented populations. I'll go through describing a little bit uh, of this graph. Typically, my header is at the top, but our graph is getting too large that I now have to put it on the side. Um, but you'll see there that in the early 70s, we didn't even have 100 underrepresented uh, minorities in the Cockrell School. Uh, the top line you'll see is a total. The line underneath is our population that identifies as Hispanic. Uh, then you'll see the next line, which is our African American Black population. And the bottom two lines are our Native American and Native Hawaiian populations. You can see there that the Hispanic population tend to drive, tends to drive our overall total number. Uh, but what I do want to emphasize is that in our Black population, our Black and African American population, we are on a steady increase uh, moving upwards. This is a population that needs the most attention and needs the most of support right now. And the university agrees with this and is helping to make those strides and make those, those efforts to, to increase this number and keep it going up. What you'll also see on the slide is various legal cases or issues that impacted the URM admission in blue. And this, I can't directly tie uh, the numbers from one place to another, but it is coincidental that every time we have an affirmative action case, our populations of underrepresented minorities uh, tend to go down in enrollment. Uh, so you can see there that um, in 78, it was UC versus Blake, uh, or Bakke, I'm sorry. Um, in 1996, it's Hopwood versus UT, 2000, the Michigan Affirmative Action case. Uh, but then the last two you'll see there were actually uh, policies that happened within the college um, that affected the enrollment, the enrollment numbers of underrepresented minorities. Uh, after 2012 and the Fisher case, you can see that we have continued to make a steady rise in, in our total numbers. All right, so when we look at the historical trends for our undergraduate women, again, looking at undergraduate women across the board, you see this nice upward trend. So this has been great with our um, largest percentage in number uh, this year, this fall, 2020. So we're excited that that trend has continued. And as Enrique mentioned, um, there are some of these cases or different changes that have have created some dips along the way. And so we pointed those out on here. Some of those same cases that impacted our URM percentages didn't quite impact our, our women numbers in the same way. Okay. All right, go for it, Enrique. <laughs> okay. So again, this is our eye chart for you, but this is our undergraduate student enrollment by uh, race and ethnicity at the top and major on the left hand side and then you can see our women numbers on the right hand column. Uh, you can see there that when looking at underrepresented populations that the numbers um, are well and you saw increasing however once you start getting into the departments and into the majors it really starts to kind of show itself as to how uh, available these students may be in in this space. Um, so one of the things that I always like to point out is like uh, if you're looking for somebody who who you need to diversify your population in one of these areas um, and you let's just take our African American or black students and you're looking to really pull in a, a environmental engineering major student into your your company right now there only is five. Um, as as it exists uh, as the first class day. So those are the types of things that um, uh, strategically companies in the past have asked us. Uh, how do we how do we know that this data is um, is is there? And how do we know that like these students are out and looking for these uh, these types of positions that you may have? Well. Uh, these students engage with us in, in our programs and uh, we encourage them to participate in these things. However, if they don't make it to the career fair or to the events that are going on, then that number tends to start to dwindle pretty rapidly. 
on the next slide, you'll see that we also have the percentages um, of this of similar as, as for the graduates. Um, and you'll see how we, uh, as a Cockrell School, need to work in, in, in various majors uh, to get these percentages up so that one, uh, you have more recruiting uh, capability of these students, but also uh, that these students also see other students like themselves in their classrooms and encourage retention and just we make more diverse engineers uh, in the field. All right, so we also have data that you will see and receive and can dive into a little bit more when you receive this presentation by major. So this shows our overall undergraduate enrollment of women, the trend over the past four years by major. So you can see by discipline where, where we stand and where we, we are currently living. Um, Overall, the trends are, are upward with the exception of petroleum, which might be as expected uh, in, in today's climate and the, uh, all of the, the oil and gas situations that were happening this past year as students were making decisions to apply. Um, our women tend to be a little more risk averse. And so um, it was not too surprising to see that percentage drop a bit. I will also note in our civil engineering department, this is one where you will also see some fluctuations in the percentages and a big drop. That was when our environmental engineering program was broken out. And we had a lot of our students who were in civil engineering who switched their major or started to apply into environmental engineering. So it kind of balanced out across architectural engineering, civil engineering, and environmental engineering within that department. And for the underrepresented enrollment, here's our five-year trend. As you can see, uh, we are on a steady rise uh, when it comes to both the total number of underrepresented minorities, but as well as our underrepresented, underrepresented minority women. Um, so you can see there that the uh, far right column or the dark blue column uh, is, rep is representative of an increase, as you can see us going um, in the past few years. Right there, you also see how much work we need to do with our African American and Black population, and still with our Native Hawaiian and Native American population as well. Here is the breakdown by major. Um, this year, I've decided to add the non-URM totals. So the uh, far right column in each of the majors is the non-URM total. And then the next column to the left of that column is our URM total. And you can see how uh, we are growing in certain majors and we are still have some room um, in order to close the gap and to, to bring more students into, into each of the majors. So we are working with various departments to figure out how to uh, engage more students in these departments. Um, but also in the chart, you can see our URM female numbers as well as the breakdown uh, of the respective underrepresented minority ethnicities. Okay, so uh, BS degrees awarded, like we stated earlier, that this is as of last year's data. Um, and so we hope to have new data when we publish and distribute this presentation, uh, or not this presentation, but the, the file that we send out every, every year. Um, and so we are doing well. We are continuing to graduate uh, a percentage, uh, a great percentage of underrepresented students as well as uh, women. Um, and in the next slide, you can see how we're doing in comparison to uh, outside uh, of the Cockrell School and the nation um, and within uh, other respective uh, ethnicities. Uh, go ahead, Trisha. So this is out of 427 engineering schools, a report to the American Society for Engineering Education. They collect this data across the country and share out um, the numbers and percentages of degrees awarded in a variety of care, uh, categories. So this is the latest data as of 2019. So this is updated. And what's exciting is that all of these went up from last year. I was excited to update the slide and put a higher number on all of them. So we're number 12 overall in engineering degrees awarded. So you're coming to the right place to reach lots of engineering students. We're number 14 in degrees awarded at the bachelor's level to underrepresented minorities, as well as to Hispanics. And then we're number 11 uh, awarding to women. So again, if you're looking for diverse engineering students, and lots of them, you are coming to the right place. 
we're, we're glad you are here and we're glad you're recruiting our fabulous students. I will say that these slides are not updated yet. Um, these slides will be updated with the 2019 data, but again, we just wanted to give you a, a preview of what you're going to see in your inbox. Um, we will have this national comparison for degrees awarded to women by major for the past several years, comparing the Cockrell School to those US averages. We will be doing the same thing for African Americans as well as for Hispanics. So those are three slides, uh, again, that aren't updated yet, but we will have that data ready to share when we send this out to you. So uh, we're gonna pause there for a moment before we move into this next phase of our presentation. Uh, there were a number of questions that came in and we've been typing answers and responses to those. So those are in the answered section um, in the Q&A pod. Uh, if there are other questions, please type them in. Um, we can come back to those as well and we'll have time at the end to, to get into that also. So thanks for throwing questions in along the way. All right. So with that, we're gonna move um, into oh, some good questions. Um, we're gonna, we're coming into our strategies to recruit diverse students. And I'm gonna save this question that came in here um, and point Michael to that one. So we're gonna talk through some different strategies and things that you can do um, to recruit all these students we've been talking about within the Cockrell School. And you've heard us talk a little bit already about our programs and the things that we have going on. Enrique, do you wanna talk about uh, these strategies? Absolutely. So partnering with diverse student organizations um, uh, is an important way in order to, one, um, get your company known uh, within the populations, uh, but also to support them in their growth in building and uh, developing their own community. So within uh, the EOE community, when it was started in 1970, um, Dr. Phil Schmidt didn't real realize that he couldn't do all the work himself. So when he created Pi Sigma Pi, he knew that there needed to be a community within students. And community has, uh, that community has flourished as a, as a student organization. And so Pi Sigma Pi, uh, NSB, SHIP, GUM, as well as all of the student organizations in the Leadership Collaborative, uh, which I believe there is one uh, in each major, and Trisha can call those out for you at some point, because <laughs> I know there's, there are tons, um, but really getting involved with them and showing your support on a consistent basis is extremely important. Also helping to follow the UT rules. Um, there are lots of things uh, and regulations and policies at UT that uh, limit the way in which you can engage with these student organizations. And so we have helped the student organizations develop a file um, and the, I guess, a, a single sheet of uh, a document in order to help them kind of guide you and guide them in how to be uh, rule followers when it comes to this partnership. So know that um, they have access to that file, we have access to that file, and if you wanna get into the details, you can always just ask us um, to, to further have a meeting, I guess, after this type of thing so that we can kind of go through those things with you. Uh, but helping them follow those rules is, is extremely important. Uh, there, are target, there are ways in order to target a stu these students who are part of these organizations, or maybe even uh, EOE and WIP, um, be, through resume searches. So in the ECAC system, you're able to do some searches via keywords. And for EOE, one of the things that I tell all of our student workers is to have the title EOE or Equal Opportunity in Engineering Program um, as a something in their title or somewhere on their resume so that if you choose to uh, support and or search people who are involved with our community and help us with our mission, then those keywords are there for you. Similar to WEP, our Women Engineering Program, as well as all of the other acronyms that our diversity organizations use. Uh, also targeting students who have scholarship um, that are either given to these diverse student organizations or through EOE and WEP as a way in, in order to just strategically recruit these students. And then just being visible and building the relationship. Um, and I would say more so just being consistent. We understand that with this COVID-19, everything is, is just all over the place. Um, but as more and more companies show up in these Zoom places or show up in whatever virtual platform, it's really impactful for the students and to see their faces light up uh, with that consistency and that effort is, is really, really powerful. 
Enrique, there was a question that I meant to type the response to, and then I didn't click the right button, of what GUM is called. <laughs> what, yes. is, what does GUM stand for? Uh, GUM is uh, Graduates for Underrepresented Minorities. Uh, so it is a very brand new uh, student organization for graduate students uh, who have been making progress over the summer. They semi started in the spring, but they're really making progress this year. And so if you're interested in getting involved with them, just let us know. Awesome, thank you. And as Enrique said, there are a number of student organizations within our Women in Engineering program umbrella, our leadership collaborative is what we call it. There are student organizations that are in the graduate student space, there are some at the undergraduate space, there are some that are just engineering wide, some that are university wide in the STEM or tech space. So there's all kinds of um, different ones that, that you can get connected in with. And I'll put the link to the, all of them in the website here shortly. The other thing that we wanted to talk about as far as um, you know, recruiting, it's really important to provide role models that our students can see. If you can't visualize yourself in a position or a company, then it's really hard to make that decision that that's the pathway that you would like to follow. Um, you know, we like people like us, that is um, you know, part of our DNA. And if we don't see those role models, it, it's hard to make those connections. And I think oftentimes companies uh, we've seen really think that it has to be some high level person that you put in front of a student. And that's tr just really not the case. Role models don't have to be corporate presidents. They don't have to be the top person in your company, the highest level person. Uh, you know, our students want to be able to get a sense of what it's gonna be like working there. So oftentimes that brand new engineer, someone that's been in their job a year or two who can really say, this is what it's like. This is why I love my job. This is why I love the work that I'm doing can really have the greatest impact than someone who is so far down their career that it's a little bit harder for our students to visualize being there. Um, you know, people who can make a real personal connection can have the greatest impact. And if you're curious about how to really empower your role models to use research-based best strategies and, and practice being a great role model, we're happy to provide that information to you. There's some great resources to be able to do that. So definitely watching your message. Um, if you do not intentionally include, then you may unintentionally exclude. And this is something that we have been uh, talking about uh, consistently in this new uh, age where we are focusing on diversity and inclusion and equity. And so you have to be intentional on your messaging and you have to be intentional on your attitude and delivery. Um, otherwise, you may unintentionally exclude certain populations that you're even trying really hard to recruit. So ensure your message um, is gender inclusive and uh, culturally responsive. Um, students are very sensitive to micro messages, um, to implicit biases, stereotype, and other discriminatory things that are, that are just in the limelight right now. Um, so if it is traditionally something that you have said and, and, oh, this is just how we say it, well, really evaluate whether or not that they are now uh, breaching these types of boundaries. Um, and keep your message real. A lot of times students can definitely see uh, or just feel when it is that you're, you're not being as real as you should. Um, and then therefore the, authentic the authenticity of the engagement and or experience tends to um, just discourage the student from being part of, of your company or just even your community as a whole. With this, we, and in a lot of uh, what we've been ha covering this summer um, and the continued work of EOE and WEP throughout the, the years, uh, we had a lot of time this summer to meet with students to talk about um, anti-racism, uh, Black Lives Matter, and the various uh, experiences they've been having. A lot of the students talked about the negative experiences they've been having at the career fair. And this uh, quote comes from one of the students we met with this summer. And they said, um, I can't tell whether, I'm, uh, whether they are discriminating, they being the corporate representative that they were standing in front of are discriminating against me because of my skin color or my GPA. And for that to go through a student's mind is already another level of stress besides the anxiety that they have just standing there wanting to, to, to just make a good impression at the booth. Um, another one uh, was a comment that we got from a student was, it's, it's not okay to assume I can speak Spanish because of my name. 
And that experience that they have immediately uh, diminished their excitement uh, as they were just really excited to talk to that company going on. Trisha, you wanna? Yeah, and then the, yeah, and then the last one here, you know, was, was someone making the assumption based on attire of what a student might or might not be interested in and where they might or might not fit in. Uh, you know, we tell our students to dress up and, you know, for, for virtual expo, dress up from, you know, the top half of you um, and making assumptions based on a student's gender or a student's attire can be problematic. And in this case, this, the student definitely felt like this was not a company that would welcome her in and she very much wanted to go work on the field. She had worked in the field with her um, hard hat and her steel toe boots and was super excited to do that again at a different company the next summer. And this completely eliminated this company from her uh, set of interests and not only her interests, but that of all of her friends. Because I think the other thing to be aware of is our students talk. They talk a lot, they share, they share experiences. And so that one interaction, while it might have been with just one person at that company and not representative of the whole, this is what lasts. And so this is why we want to make sure that you aware, are aware of what's going on in our student conversations. Um, and as Enrique said, they are hyper aware, they are hypersensitive right now, they are paying attention, and they're talking. So we want to make sure that you are empowered to make sure that all of your recruiters and all of those representing your companies are, are representing themselves and your company in the best light and being responsive to, to the students and especially our diverse students. And I guess a, a little plug there at the bottom, you know, this is the work that Enrique and I do all the time. Um, you know, I've done this for 18 years. We have a slew of workshops that we do with our students, with our faculty, with our staff. Um, we call it our You Belong Here workshop series. Um, we do this in partnership with the College of Natural Sciences. We've been reaching students across our two colleges um, and beyond in the university for the past several years. And, and we're happy to visit with you a little bit more about any of those workshops. And um, you know, happy if time is, is available and or capacity is there to do those in other spaces as well. So that's uh, it for the moment on our end. And we are going to turn it over to Michael Powell because we know that you all may have some questions about Career Eco next week and Expo and wanted to give him some time to, to talk with you and answer questions that you might have. Michael. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you for attending this event and also uh, I assume by your being here that you will also be seeing us in one week or one week in a day. Uh, for day one and day two of Expo. So thank you also for your participation there. I can tell you the students are getting very excited. Just to follow up quickly on the last couple of slides that Enrique and uh, Tricia were going over. Um, one of the things that we are featuring uh, this year and planning to take going forward is uh, a report of bias survey for our students. And we're probably going to expand this more to general career events, but we are having one that is Expo specific. Uh, and this survey is really for students to be able to report any concerns that they had around the event. It's not meant to be any kind of a gotcha uh, for employers or anything like that. It's really meant to be, uh, first of all, a space for students to feel that they can share experiences. Uh, but also to be educational. So if anything comes up, we hope that it winds up leading simply to uh, better recruiting practices and knowledge and awareness. Uh, so just an FYI that that will be there um, as, excuse me, as part of the uh, event this year and likely going forward. A couple of things I, I do wanna say, first of all, the obvious it is virtual. Um, we do actually have a good number of, uh, of you all uh, participating, and we're very happy about that, especially with everything going on. We currently have, I say currently, because that's probably the number we'll wind up with, but around 235 employers over the course of the two days. Uh, so congratulations to you all for joining virtual recruiting. Uh, some of you probably are experienced with virtual recruiting and use some of the platforms. Some of you may be brand new to it. It's all okay, we're gonna make it work. Typically, students will attend Expo at about a, a pace of 3,000 per day. Uh, so we don't know exactly what it's going to look like in virtual world. We could have more because they don't have to actually travel. Could be less just because of all of the 
different things going on and, and, and other uh, issues that may be happening uh, just around a virtual environment and, and this atmosphere. But I am uh, certainly hopeful and planning for quite a lot of engagement uh, at the events. So looking forward to that. A um, couple of things about the virtual fair. And again, some of you may be experienced with it. Some of you may be new. We did go with a, a platform called Career Eco. I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of about half a dozen or more platforms that do virtual career fairs now. And I don't envy uh, you having to um, figure out all the nuances of all the different ones. Certainly it was fun for us figuring out all the nuances as we were trying to set it up. But we ultimately went with Career Eco, which is the oldest uh, virtual career fair platform, uh, the most established, and still currently, uh, arguably, um, the most robust. And for a two-day fair where we have this level of engagement, we wanted to be as sure as we could that uh, it would be a, on a robust platform. And so we are hopeful and optimistic that there will be a uh, few technical glitches that also happen during this event. I've already been talking to a lot of students uh, who are uh, having a mix of excitement and also anxiety uh, bordering on terror because it's just the way they are. They want to make a good impression on you. Uh, they know it's going to be an awkward event. Um, and I want to for, uh, also say to you, it is going to be a little bit awkward, for, especially for those of you who haven't done the virtual career fair before. It's going to be awkward, and we're all kind of embracing that. That you know, you're going to have these group chat rooms, uh, and people aren't going to be sure necessarily how to engage in a group chat room. Uh, they're they're not going to be sure what the etiquette is. They're not going to be sure if they should start talking or not talking. So some of the things that that you all can do is first of all know that by being registered for the fair now, you have access to your chat room. So if you haven't already, please go into your account and play around with your chat room as much as you want. No one is going to be jumping in there right now, so just really get familiar with it. First and foremost, pick the times that you want for your chat room. Uh, the fair goes from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. You are more than welcome to have that chat room all that time, or you can build in a lunch hour or something like that where you're on break. The chat room times will be published so that students will be aware of it and they can plan accordingly. A couple other things is, is really, for lack of a better way of saying it, decorate your room. I mean, you can, you can put an opening message in there to students. You can have access to files that they can download. You can have links to your social media and LinkedIn and those kinds of things. Uh, and that gives a chance for students to look at things when they go into the chat room. A couple of other things that you may want to consider, you do have the ability to have a running video going and you can be actually talking to students or you can be doing it by text. But uh, one recommendation is that you do have an active chat room, maybe have one or two people even that's really in charge of the chat room to just keep uh, conversations going, to keep engaged with students. You'll see them coming into your room. You'll be able to see what order they came in and they're going to be wondering in some cases, what to do next. And so they're really hoping that at some point, if they introduce themselves, somebody will say hi back and maybe even ultimately get that, 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 that wonderful thing they want, which is a one-on-one -on -one chat with somebody. So one pro tip would be to have one or two people, and you can have up to eight representatives in the room, but have one or two people maybe managing the chat room uh, and keeping that flowing and going and then have other representatives that are available for one-on-one -on -one chats. And then they can even pick students uh, as appropriate to have those one-on-one -on -one chats with. That'll certainly make things better on the students because again, the students are even less experienced with virtual uh, career fairs probably than a lot of you are. Uh, and so they're really just looking for that engagement. They're again, happy and excited uh, to have that engagement but also a bit anxious about uh, making good impression in an environment that they're not used to making a good impression in. Uh, so I've assured them that uh, you all are going to be forgiving of them uh, in terms of any uh, honest mistakes that they make. And, and, there's, and I've asked them to be forgiving of you all of any awkwardness or honest mistakes that you make uh, in the whole process of being in this technical world. But again, if you go into your chat room, start practicing now, you can, you can make a great group chat room and really have a strategy for the day or days of the fair, and that'll make everything just golden. What I'm gonna do is in the chat, I'm going to give two links. One is a short employer video that just kind of gets you set up uh, that's produced by Career Eco. 
that gets you set up for just your, uh, just making sure you've got everything straight for your involvement in the fair. The second one is a nice long one. It's about 30 minutes long, but it will tell you everything you need to know to set up your chat room in the best way. So I definitely also recommend that if you're not familiar, and then you can really decide over this next week what you want your chat room to look like, what you want your strategy to be, and then you'll have that welcoming environment for students to walk into and be able to engage with you. Uh, I think that's it, other than I will put the links in the chat and will be remain available for Q&A. Thank you all. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael. Hopefully that was helpful to you all as well. All right, so what can you expect next? Well, we're going to, as we've been saying all along, we're going to email out all of this information to you. We are going to send it to your Expo primary contact. So whoever received the reminder this morning is the email address that we have and we'll send out to. If by chance you did not receive that email and want to get this directly, you can email me. I stuck my email address in the chat or email Enrique or Allison or Michael or Michelle, any of us, and we can make sure that we get you added in. We're not going to send that until our fall 2020 data is finalized. We want to make sure we get all of those things updated and send you the correct information. All we have right now is our first class day data, which is sometimes a little bumpy and perhaps could be a little bumpier than usual right now in our virtual world. So we wait until after the 12th class day when all of the data is finalized. And the 12th class day, I believe, is like September 15th or something, September 13th, somewhere in there. So mid to late September, we will get this updated and sent out to all of you. If for some reason there's some part of this that you want a little bit earlier, don't hesitate to reach out and we can share that. I also encourage you to reach out to EOE and WEP, to Allison, Michelle, any of us to learn more ways of how you can enhance your recruiting of diverse engineering students. We've given you some ways, we've given you some tips. We have lots of programs, lots of events, lots of student organizations, all designed to help connect you in and to help support your efforts while also supporting our efforts to re retain our students and give them that career and leadership development experience that we know they need as they head towards graduation. So don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. We will stick around for a little bit longer if you have any questions for any of us. We'll be happy to answer those, throw those in the, the Q&A or in the chat at this point. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll also be putting this recording up on our YouTube channel, so we'll share that out as well, and we'll share that out sooner than later. We won't wait till the end of September to do that in case you have others that would like to watch this and learn. Thanks again, everybody. And thanks, Allison, Michael, and Michelle for joining in Enrique and me.